In Galatians uh, chapter 6 and 7, we uh, use this as our uh, theme for this year, and uh, one of the things that uh, we've used as our, our verse to follow, and uh, our theme for the year has been service, and that's been our, our mission statement, our goal, how we as uh, God's people are to serve him. And today I'd like to talk about uh, the subject of you reap what you sow, and uh, this is kind of going to be related to our Grow Outreach ministry that we have here in our church. And uh, this uh, saying, you reap what you sow, is commonly used, and um, uh, you've also heard the saying, you, you, uh, you sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind, and um, these are phrases that we're familiar with, but sometimes we forget that uh, they're more than just phrases, they actually have uh, some spiritual uh, power behind them because our lives and what we invest our lives in uh, become uh, very important. And what we do in a positive way uh, re reaps good results. What we do in a negative way uh, reaps bad results. But uh, talking about growth in general, um, growth is a miracle, isn't it? It's something that we can't explain, something that we uh, can observe, but we can't really understand fully how that takes place. Uh, and uh, as farmers know, gardeners know, you, you take a single dormant seed and you put it in the ground and suddenly it mysteriously springs to life. And uh, if you nurture it well, it will eventually produce a bountiful harvest. Uh, so what we plant is important. And uh, the scripture in Galatians 6, 7 says this, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. And so there's a spiritual principle, not only in the physical realm of life, but also in the spiritual realm of life, that what we plant uh, is going to bring about a harvest. It's going to grow something. And uh, God is not mocked. Whatever you reap, that's um, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. That's a principle God has given to us. And Paul uses that principle to uh, remind us that we need to be uh, very careful what it is that we plant. You see, the seeds we plant determine the harvest that uh, we're going to reap. And uh, Christians uh, can develop, or another way to say that, Christians can grow in their spiritual life. And that, to a large extent, depends upon what we plant in our spiritual lives. And so I'd like to talk today about uh, three good seeds we can plant so we can grow in our Christian life. Three things we can plant spiritually that will enable us to reap a good harvest in our life. So we reap what we sow. We reap a bountiful harvest that God intends for us. And the good thing is, is that when we plant these seeds, God causes them to grow and we can depend on that. The first uh, seed we want to talk about is that we can sow seeds of worship. We can sow seeds of worship. And uh, I know uh, Mario recently preached on the subject of worship, and, and uh, you've heard me preach about worship over the years. But uh, the idea of worship is, it, uh, as the English version of that is, the background to the word is worth-ship. And uh, the idea is we give God his worth. We were just singing a song, holy, 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 holy. And the scripture tells us that that's what's being sung around the throne of God, reminding God that he is holy, that he is greatly to be praised. Uh, it, it is what he is worth. And so we give him his worth. We worship him by honoring him, reminding him that he is holy. And uh, we come before him, obviously not holy, Obviously, people in need, obviously people that have to depend on his holiness to uh, make us right in his presence. So worship is a way in which we come before God and let him know that we love him and we honor him and we recognize who he is. And so we can sow uh, different kinds of seeds. We can sow seeds of the flesh or we can sow seeds of the spirit. And, and worship is focusing everything we do to please and honor God. That's giving him his worth -ship. 
That's letting him know how much we love him. So there's two options we have. You can continue to feed the flesh and follow after its impulses and desires, or you can begin to sow seeds of the spirit that enable us to grow spiritually in our lives. As Galatians 6, 8 says, if you plant in the field of your natural desires, from it you will gather the harvest of death. If you plant in the field of the spirit, from the spirit you will gather the harvest of eternal life. Now you say, well, what does he mean, plant in the field of your natural desires? Well, if you go back to chapter 5, you'll recognize that he lists a whole bunch of things that he considers uh, the field of our natural desires. In Galatians 5.19, he says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He says these are our natural desires. These are things that are contrary to what God wants for us. Uh, are they of the flesh? Yes, the sinful flesh, the sin nature, that which goes contrary to what God wants. And so if we sow seeds to those areas of our lives, we're going to reap a harvest. And it's going to be a harvest of death, uh, the Apostle Paul says. As the Bible tells us, the wages of sin is death. And so we're going to receive those uh, wages. We're going to sow uh, that harvest or re reap that harvest if we sow to the seeds of the sinful nature. But he says if you plant in the field of the Spirit, you're going to gather a harvest of eternal life. So what is the field of the Spirit? Well, he says in verse 22 of chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are the good things. And if we sow seeds in those areas of our lives, then we're going to reap a harvest. We're going to reap a harvest, a spiritual harvest, that the uh, Holy Spirit implants into our lives. So what are we talking about? Well, if um, you, you feed your depression, you're going to reap a harvest of depression. If you feed your negativity, everything about you is going to be negative, and that's all you're going to see. If you feed um, your impulses, then you're going to be a person that's out of control. If you feed uh, your anger or if you feed your hatred, those are things that are going to manifest themselves in your relationship with other people. That's why it's so very important that we be careful what we're listening to. Um, I mean, it, it's almost like the media is poison nowadays because everything you hear, you don't know. Uh, what is true, what isn't true. And, and so uh, we're not just talking about, quote, fake news as been commonly thrown around. We're just talking about a spirit an attitude of negativity and depression and criticism and hatred and constant belittling and tearing down. If you fill your life with that stuff, that's the way you're going to live. And we as Christians need to remind ourselves that's not what God wants us to sow into our lives. The scripture tells us that whatever is pure and good and righteous and holy we're to think on these things. The Bible says, set your mind on things above, not on things below. And when you start filling your mind with the good things of God, then your life is going to reflect that. How do you become a person of love? Well, you become, you become in a relationship with God in which his love begins to uh, speak to you and you begin to understand his presence and, and how much he loves you. And when you experience God's love, you in turn can love others. Because isn't that what he says? Love the Lord your God and then love your neighbor. As we build our relationship with God and sow seeds of love to him, we're also going to begin to love others and share that love uh, with other people. So we, we need to have an uh, attitude and a spirit that begins so, to sow seeds of the spirit rather than seeds of the flesh. And um, 
One way in which we can do that is uh, through praise. And that gets us back to this whole idea of worship. God deserves our praise. The scripture says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, if you're all, all you're doing is going around mouthing negative things, whether they're political or whether they're any other kind of negativity, guess what's going to happen? That's going to be your spirit. That's going to be your attitude. But if you begin to cultivate a life of praise and worship, and you begin to praise the Lord, suddenly you're going to have a completely different outlook on life. How is it that, that people of faith can go through tremendous trials, tremendous difficulties, and, and still have a good attitude toward life? It's because they've learned that God's in control and they can praise him in all situations. And in the midst of everything, they can give thanks. They can trust the Lord and thank him for his presence, even though the circumstances might be bad. And so we need to cultivate this uh, spirit of praise. That's one way in which we sow seeds of worship. Uh, another uh, way we can do that is through corporate worship where we gather like this on a Sunday morning and we praise the Lord together. Now, some people here might say, well, you know, when the Bible says make a joyful noise to the Lord, that's pretty much what I do. I just make a bunch of noise. But that's okay because it's not whether you have talented vocal cords that God's worried about. He wants to know if you have a spirit of praise in your heart to thank him and worship him. And so you might be off key, but if you're singing loud and you're praising the Lord, God recognizes that and he loves that and he, he appreciates that. So corporate worship is, is very important. We need to gather. That's one reason why we gather together as God's people so we can worship together. Isn't it much easier to sing when you have a bunch of people around you? I mean... My wife loves to hear me sing in the shower, okay? Not, okay? But if we have a whole bunch of people together in corporate worship on a Sunday morning singing praises, it doesn't matter if I'm off key or not. All of us are lifting up the Lord and praising him. And suddenly God is honored. You see, God has made us to be his creatures. He's the creator, we're his creatures. And so what, what do birds do? Birds sing, right? What do trees do? Trees wave in the breeze. What, what do waves do? Waves roll in and crash on the seashore. And it's all their way of giving thanks to God and praise to God for what they are as his creatures. And what do we do? What we do is we praise we praise God with our lips and with our spirit and with our mind and with our lives. That's how we worship the Lord. So God deserves our praise. And also God chooses to dwell where he is praised. That's the, that's the wonderful thing about all this is that God is really there. And when we come into his presence and praise him, suddenly we're in his presence. Psalm 22.3. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. When, when we lift up the Lord and we praise him, God's presence is there. God is among us and he's with us because he chooses to dwell where he is praised. What is it Jesus said? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there what? Am I in the midst of them? You see, when we gather together, we praise the Lord. And we worship the Lord Jesus. He is there with us. He's here with us right now. And we need to remember that. This isn't about just people gathering together to sing a bunch of songs. No. We're gathered in his name. We're gathered in his presence. And he is here with us by his spirit. And we are honoring him with our lives and with our lips. And, and you know, uh, the scripture promises us that the Lord rewards those who earnestly desire to know him. 
The Lord rewards those who earnestly desire to know him. And if you have a heart that's seeking God, wanting to praise him, if you have a heart that's sowing seeds of worship, he's going to come and meet with you. Hebrews 11, 6, it says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He rewards those who earnestly seek him. In other words, they reap a harvest. If you're seeking the Lord, he's going to give you the harvest. The seeds that you plant of worship and praise, he's going to bring a result into your life. He's going to give you a harvest in your life. And he's going to be present with you. And he will let you know him in a very special way. That's why it's important to meet in small groups. That's why it's important to have your private devotional life. Because that is a way in which you seek the Lord. That's a way in which you come before him and desire to know him. It's one thing to worship corporately and praise. It's another thing to meet in small groups and talk about God's word and, and learn from each other and share with each other. Because your life touches my life. My life touches your life. And we learn from one another. It's not that we all have it together. As a matter of fact, when we gather in small groups, it's an acknowledgement we don't have it all together and we need each other as we go on this journey together. And so that's a way of seeking the Lord, but also taking time each day just to spend time with the Lord. Uh, you decide how much time you're going to spend with the Lord, but be sure to spend time with the Lord, reading his word, praying, talking with him, honoring him with your lips and, and your life as you go each and every day. So we need to sow seeds of worship. You, you see, we can grow through worship because God rewards our worship. And then secondly, we need to sow seeds of, of witness. Sow seeds of witness. Uh, this is an important area of our life where we begin to share our faith with other people. We let other people know that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And one way we can do that is to sow seeds of witness. That means that we, through our actions and through our words, are letting people know we're followers of Jesus and that uh, we honor him with our lives. Jesus, as a matter of fact, said that every one of his followers would be a witness. Every one of us would be a witness. So if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a witness. Now, the question is, what kind of witness are you? Are you a good witness or are you a witness who's not honoring Jesus and not bringing glory to his name? Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses, Jesus said. You will be people who honor me with your lips and your lives. You'll be people who tell others about me. And, and so we need to recognize that we are witnesses already. And Jesus uh, made it <clears throat> a part of the life that we are to live in sharing our faith with others, telling them about Jesus as well. Now it's important, I know that uh, many of you like I did saw on the news this week Congressman Steve Scalise, was, uh, who was wounded uh, in an attack on some Congress uh, people this summer by a gunman, and he was seriously injured, almost uh, died as a result of his injuries. Went through a lot of rehab and recovery, but he was able to walk in to Congress this week using uh, uh, hand uh, helps and aids but he was able to walk in and speak to uh, Congress. And they all gave him a standing ovation. But well, I don't know if you heard what I heard in his testimony. But he was a witness for the Lord Jesus there. As he began to give honor to God for seeing him through. And he said that after he was shot, he was laying there on the field, realizing he was seriously injured. He said, I looked to the Lord and I said, Lord I give myself to you. It's out of my hands. It all depends on you now. In other words, he gave a witness before 
all of his fellow Congress uh, people about his love for God and his dependence on God in that moment. He became not only a testimony to God's miraculous power to bring him through, but also a testimony of one who was a follower of Jesus that gave God the glory as a result of answered prayer. We can be a witness because being a witness means that you just tell your story, don't you? A witness gives a personal testimony about what he or she has seen or heard or experienced. And so as a Christian, you're having a relationship with Jesus Christ. You're having fellowship with him day by day. You're growing in the Lord. At least that's the way it should be. And so as a result of that, you have something to share with other people. You might go through a trial like Steve Scalise did, and God brings you through. And so you have a testimony. You are a witness. You can tell others how God brought you through that experience. You, you might uh, be in prayer about a wayward child. Or you might be in prayer about a certain need in your life, and God answers your prayer. And you become a witness. You have a personal testimony that God not only hears our prayers, he answers our prayers. And you can give witness to that. You see, God is at work in your life, and he wants you to share what he's doing in your life with other people. To let them know that God is still at work in this world. People are looking for God. People want to know there's hope. People want to know that God is still at work around us. And if you're silent about what God's doing in your life, you're, you're not only being selfish, you're also hindering them from discovering that God is a wonder-working God who's still doing miracles in this world. And so we need to give our testimony, tell what God is doing in our lives. As the Apostle John wrote in 1 John, the life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. And he goes on. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Do you see what John is doing here? He begins his letter by saying, look, I'm not going to tell you a, a theory. I'm not going to tell you some philosophy. I'm not going to tell you some ideas I have or my personal opinion. I'm going to tell you my testimony, what I have seen and what I've heard. And I want you to share that with me. That's what a witness does. They share what God has already done in his or her life. And they let others know that God can do the same thing in their lives as well. And, and we've talked about this before, that, that everyone has a personal testimony. And it's just a three-part testimony. You can tell what your life was like before you became a Christian. And you can tell how you became a Christian. And then you can tell people what Jesus has done in your life since you became a Christian. It doesn't take you long to do that. You, you can give that testimony in under two minutes. And, and it's very important that you go over in your mind that if I have an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus, then I know exactly what I'm going to say. And that three-part testimony is very easy to do. This is the way I was before I became a Christian. This is how I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And this is what Jesus has done in my life since I've become a Christian. And, and so I, I encourage you to think about that. How are you going to give your testimony? How are you going to tell others about Jesus when the opportunity uh, arises? As John says, we proclaim to you what we've seen and heard. And that's exactly what you need to be able to do. Tell others what you've seen and what you've heard and how Jesus has transformed your life. And here's a wonderful promise. <coughs> this is part of the harvest. The Lord gives success to those who tell others about him. 
You want victory in your life? You, you want to see power in your life? Start telling people about Jesus. Start giving your testimony. You, you see, the Lord gives success to those who tell others about him. Uh, as Galatians 6, 9 says, So let us not become tired of doing good, for if we do not give up, the time will come when we will reap the harvest. And, and what Paul is saying here is, keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Give your testimony. Share your life with others. Begin to serve the Lord in a variety of ways. And the result is this. God is going to let you reap a harvest. You're going to see some results. He's going to give you success. So don't give up. Don't become weary in well-doing. Keep on keeping on doing what God has called you to do. We're the kind of people that, uh, like Winston Churchill said, when he gave that famous speech at the school that he had gone to as a child, he just gave a very simple speech. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. And he sat down. And that's what we as Christians need to do. Never give up. Always keep on doing what God has called you to do. Because we know we're going to reap a harvest. As Eugene McCarthy used to say, the world is changed by people who show up. And so we need to show up every day. We need to get up in the morning, thank God for life, for health, for breath, for the opportunity to serve him, and then go out and do what God has called you to do. Because the world is changed by people that show up. Are, are you showing up? Are you giving your testimony? You see, God promises us success when we tell others about him. Now, the wonderful verse in Revelation 12 tells us about what John saw there in heaven. And he talks about those who are around the throne. And he says these words, they overcame him, talking about the devil, by the blood of the lamb, and by the word of their testimony. You want victory in your spiritual life? You want to be able to resist the devil and his temptations? You want to be able to have the power to overcome? Well, you need to do two things. One, depend on the finished work of Jesus, what he's done for you on the cross through his shed blood. And secondly, you need to speak up and tell others about Jesus. That will give you victory. That will allow you to be an overcomer in this life as a Christian. You see, we can grow through our witness. We can grow through our witness. Why? Because God rewards our witness. And then finally, here's another seed. We can sow seeds of work. We can sow seeds of work. This, this kind of goes on with what we just said, that we're not to become weary in well-doing. We need to continue to work. We need to continue to labor. You see, labor is necessary for success and growth. Labor is necessary for success and growth. Proverbs 13, 4 says this, lazy people want much but get little, while the diligent are prospering. Just think of a farmer. What's a farmer have to do? A farmer goes out and, and looks at that field, and the farmer has to, to tear that soil up. Farmer has to plow that land up. And then after the farmer plows the land up, the farmer has to go out and plant the seeds and put the seeds in, into the ground. And then after the farmer plants the seeds, the farmer has to make sure, first of all, that it's watered, that it's nurtured, and he has to pull the weeds and make sure that those seeds are cultivated over time. And then what happens? Eventually, eventually, the seeds begin to grow. And once the seeds grow, they produce the fruit, the harvest that they want to reap from that crop that's been planted. Now, that, that took a lot of work to get the results, didn't it? The farmer had to put in the work in order to see the results. Whether you're talking about labor in general or whether you're talking about your spiritual life. We have certain things we need to invest, certain work and labor that has to be done for us to see the results in which God brings about. As, as Proverbs says, lazy people want much but get little. 
uh, a lazy farmer that doesn't go out and plow the field can't expect a harvest. He has to go out there and do the work. Diligent people are prospering, and God wants us to prosper. So labor is necessary for success and growth. As it says in Romans 12, 11, and this goes into the spiritual realm, never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. Uh, as it says, I think in King James, be diligent about your business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. In other words, we need to be people of diligence, people who have effort, people who work and labor hard. Now let me tell you a little secret, okay? And, and if you're a young person and you learn the secret now, it'll save you a lot of headaches in life, okay? And maybe you're one of those adults that's never learned this lesson yet. L let me just tell you a little secret about work, okay? You work for the Lord. If you're a Christian, you're working for Jesus. You're not working for your boss. You're not working for your foreman. You're not working for your company. You work for Jesus. So it doesn't matter what a jerk your supervisor is. It doesn't matter where your company's policy is fair. And it doesn't matter whether your foreman knows what he's really doing because you're not working for them you're working for Jesus now if you don't like your job you can start looking for other jobs to find a better paying job or a job that's uh, more emotionally fulfilling but in the meantime where you're at the circumstances don't matter you're working for Jesus be diligent about your business fervent in spirit serving who? the Lord the Lord. Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. And if you learn that little secret in life, it's going to save you a lot of headaches and a lot of pain and a lot of not getting fired. So that's just an aside. I hope you like that. You see, the same thing happens in the spiritual realm. That God's work requires workers as well. God's work requires workers. Jesus, Jesus was not one of these pie-in-the-sky people. He was very pragmatic, very realistic. He looked out and he saw the fields. They were ripe to the harvest. And he's thinking to himself, I need to let my disciples know something here. So Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, notice two things. The field's already ripe. The field's ready to be picked. <coughs> the field's ready to be reaped. The only thing that's lacking is workers. The only thing that's lacking is workers. Um, just, just to give a Puerto Rican example. They have everything they need on the, on the docks. What they didn't have was truck drivers to deliver them and, and have the roads cleared off to make sure the deliveries got there. You know, keeping all politics out of it, whether you're involved in that or not, the fact was they didn't have enough workers. They had the supplies and materials, but they didn't have enough workers to get the supplies in the right place. Same thing spiritually. Jesus says, the fields are ripe. It's ready for the harvest. What do we need? We need workers. So pray that the Lord will send out workers. So we need to be praying that God will send out workers. That God will provide workers for the ministries and activities he wants his people involved in. And we need to ask ourselves, am I one of those workers that God wants to use? And, and we begin to pray that prayer, and God begins to move our hearts, so we become people of the harvest as well. You see, God honors all of our efforts for him. So no matter what we do, if we do it in the name of Jesus, and we're doing it diligently, serving the Lord, 
God's going to honor those things. He's going to honor our efforts for him. In Galatians 6.10, it says, So then as often as we have the chance, we should do good to everyone, and especially to those who belong to our family in the faith. We're, we're to be people who are constantly at work doing what honors God and pleases him. You see, I like what Jesus said. Jesus recognized that no matter what it was you did in his name, it would have a reward. He said, even a cup of water given in my name will be blessed, didn't he? Just a cup of water given in my name. So don't think that your efforts are minimal. God honors all of our efforts. God wants all of us to be involved in ministry and activity and service. And so we need, need to say, Lord, you need workers. I'm available. What is it you want me to do? And, and so the Lord will open up your eyes. It might be a ministry that, that uh, is right here in our church that you can become involved in. And I'm sure if you contacted Henry, he would tell you, hey, nominating committee has a bunch of areas you can serve in and through our church. Uh, you can serve in the food ministry. You, you can serve uh, with Habitat for Humanity. You can serve with all kinds of other areas in our, in our fellowship, especially International Learning Center, which needs constant helpers and workers and aides, especially nursery workers. Whatever it is you can do, the Lord's going to honor that. He's going to bless that. And so we need to be active and involved in doing those things. You, you see... 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Do you, do you want a lasting result? Do you want something that reaps an eternal harvest and reward? Then do something for Jesus. Be involved in his work, because that's what's going to last for eternity. That's what's going to be remembered beyond this world's existence. Something that's done in his name. His one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's an old phrase, an old saying, but it's true. And so we need to ask ourselves, what am I doing for the Lord? How am I serving him? But your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's something that's eternal and will last for eternity. Now, one thing that uh, we're involved in as God's people is that the Lord calls all of us to be a witness. And one of the areas we have in which you can be a witness and serve is our ministry of grow. And uh, this is God rewards our work. God, um, it's our outreach effort. Uh, we meet on Tuesday nights, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, Tuesday night's the only night you can do Outreach. You can do outreach the entire week. If you can't be there on Tuesday nights, that's fine. We'll work out arrangements where you can work in other ways. But the important thing is, is that you're part of a regular outreach effort. And GROW is, is our way of saying to you, look, you can be involved in what Jesus has called you to do. He gave us the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. And he said, you're going to be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. And so how do, you, how do you obey what Jesus has told us to do? Well, one way is through the ministry of GROW. And uh, what GROW is is simply you can come and write letters. We have uh, people we write letters to, people that move to our area on a monthly basis. We send them a new uh, prospect letter and visitor letter. You can uh, make phone calls. You can go visit shut-ins. You can go make hospital visits. You can visit people that have visited our church. Um, all kinds of ways in which you can be involved in outreach. And some of those may require you just to sit in a room and write a letter. Others may in involve you going out and knocking on doors. And like I say, it doesn't have to be just Tuesday night. If you have some people that you can get some names from us, and you can visit them during the daytime, that's wonderful too. The important thing is this. All of us need to be uh, sure that we're actively involved 
in the work of the Lord. And we're being obedient to the Great Commission. And we're being witnesses for Jesus. And grow is one way in which you can do that. And the, and the important thing is this. We're not asking you to do that week after week after week. We're asking you to just take one week out of the month, an hour and a half of your time, to be a witness for Jesus. That's not asking a lot, is it? More, most of you spend more time getting ready for a Gator game than, than that, okay? It's important that you do something for Jesus. Why not invest yourself in something that's going to last for eternity? You don't know whose life's going to be changed because of your efforts to work out, to, to reach out uh, to people in the Lord's name. You see, here, here's the reason why. The best work is teamwork. Paul wrote these words. God is important because he's the one who makes things grow. Apollos and I are working as a team with the same aim, though each of us will be rewarded for his own hard work. We're only God's co-workers. Paul and, and, Barnab Paul and Apollos were not competitors. They were co-workers. They were involved in a team. It was a team effort. And, and Apollos was watering what Paul had already planted. And both of them had a part in God's kingdom work. And that's what all of us are. We're co-workers together. We're on a team. And one way in which you can become involved is, is through the ministry of Grow. Now in your bulletin, there's a little form. Some of you already filled this form out this year, but others may not have. And, and this is just a way in which you can become involved in Grow Outreach Ministry. And all we're asking is you fill this form out and say, Pastor, I, I want to be involved in Grow, and I'm going to choose this Tuesday night, or I'm going to choose this alternate way in which I can serve. But uh, we want everybody to be involved. That way you can be on the team. That way you can be involved in outreach in our church. So if you haven't filled one of these out yet, be sure to do that today and drop it in the offering plate later on in the service. We want you to be on a team. We want you to be a part of uh, outreach as we minister to people uh, in this area. We need you. And grow is one way in which we can serve together. You see, we can grow through our work for the Lord. God rewards our work. Are you ready to work? Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, we thank you that we can plant some good seeds that will reap a good harvest, that we can worship, that we can witness, that we can work. And so we pray, Lord, that we'll begin to consciously plant these good seeds in our lives, not only so that people's lives can be changed, not only so that you can be honored, but also that we can grow spiritually in our walk with you. So Lord, I pray that each one here will make a commitment to plant good seeds in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation and invite you to come. God's speaking to you today. Let's stand together as we sing.